I'd like to welcome you all to Good Shepherd Free Lutheran Church, and we're glad that you're here to worship with us. And if you are a visitor, we're especially glad to have you, and if you wouldn't mind letting us know or signing a little card in the pew and put it in the offering plate, uh, we invite you to come back to worship with us again. Some of the announcements we'd like to highlight today are next Wednesday's activities. We have a Bible studies, confirmation, uh, Peniel Youth, there's Kids Light, there's uh, uh, bi adult Bible study and choir practice, lots of things, lots, lots of opportunities to take part in there. So mark that on your calendar. Next Sunday, we be have our obligation to have someone talk and lead the service at the Cocado Manor, and the deacons will be looking for someone. Uh, to fill those Sundays. If uh, you have an opportunity or if you feel led, please let Josh Berge or Craig Anderson, Glenn Mork, or Nathan Niemelin know. Otherwise, they're going to be asking you. So the other thing about uh, next Sunday, we're having the installation in a potluck, so communion will happen on the 14th. It'll be the second Sunday because uh, trying to cram so many things into there. Just moved it one week. And along with that potluck, just take note in the bulletin, it says if, because of allergies, if you could just label the items that you have with, uh, they've mentioned here, containing seafood, nuts, or strawberries, that would be very helpful. And also, on October 13th, we have the game night starting up again. So if you have a game you can bring, uh, snacks, uh, it starts at 6.30, it's a great opportunity to meet, get together, find, have some fun together. We also have Meals on Wheels. There's a sign-up sheet in the entryway, if you would take note. It's from October 15th to 31st. If you would uh, help out with that, would be greatly appreciated. I also want to make note on the very top of the bulletin on the um, second page part that we would try and have the sanctuary quiet for those who come in. Um, out of respect for preparing for worship. You know, we have our fellowship hall back there. That's great. Uh, some would like to come in a little early just to prepare their hearts and minds for that. If we could be mindful of that, it'd be great. We would appreciate that. Uh, I have uh, a sign-up sheet for the youth. They had said if they would go to the apple orchard, which is coming up this Saturday, and we have a lot of question marks. So I'm going to leave this on the entry table and if you as parents could look at that and either leave, uh, cross off the name or cross off the question mark so we know exactly how many people are going to be going so we can arrange transportation appropriately. And there's also some notices that have been put in mailboxes regarding Sunday school program practices and uh, Pray For Me campaign. That's uh, the second Sunday in October. Those of you who are involved in that or have uh, signed up or said you would, note those things in your mailbox for time and place. And I had an announcement that will also go on to the prayer requests. Uh, Bob and Mary Kay Morris recently lost their youngest son, Isaac, to death. Uh, I guess he's a recent high school grad. So we were pray for that family during this time. I'd like to read the psalm that was in the bulletin <clears throat> as a preparing for worship. All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke, I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. May my 
sinners van but may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more praise the lord my soul praise the lord father god we just ask your presence here at this time of worship that it would be honoring and give you glory and praise that you would focus our hearts and minds on you and remove the busyness and the clutter of all the things that are happening in our week and that you would be in the hearts that are grieving in pain that you would give comfort in jesus name amen if you would stand for the opening hymn please I guess there's one other announcement that we wanted to uh, include here. Kind of debated in my mind, do I wait till you come up to read scripture or just have you come up twice? So, <laughs> Yeah, on October 14th, uh, Good Shepherd is hosting uh, David Anderson concert. And so uh, we're looking for uh, some housing available for him. I believe it's uh, that Sunday night after the concert. So if anyone is able to do that, um, they'll be needing uh, two beds, uh, him and his uh, guitarist. And so um, they can either split up or be in the same house. But uh, you can talk to one of the deacons or one of the pastors about that. Thank you. So now we'll have a time of praise and petitions. Okay, okay. We're gonna. Kenny has a prayer request for the people who are involved in the forest fires. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, can you say a prayer for people in the row that don't have much food to eat? All right. And Dave, pray for the people who are lacking in food. And Grace, I mean, Carly. Hi, Kayla. Yes. Unspoken. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good weather for harvest. Okay. So, Schmieg, Mar Mar Marlon Schmieg, Merlin, Merlin. You need in the hospital. Praying for. 
Okay. So wisdom for the doctors and finding out's wrong. Unspoken and pray for our country and our president. Okay, surely. Uh, unspoken prayer and pray for a president and our country. And Bruce? Midterm elections. And then pray for the Supreme Court justice process. Pray for the Supreme Court justice process. Kate. And his name is Dave Filer. A co-worker of Kate's died in a car accident this past week. And his name is David Filer. And pray for him and his family and others involved in that accident. Okay, pray for Steve Paulson battling cancer, and in hospice. Paul. I'd like to ask prayer for uh, the fellow I work in Gabon with. His name is Jean Marc. Jean Marc. Jean Marc. Jean Marc. And he uh, had his computer stolen. He was kind of in charge of coordinating this eight language project. And I'd just like to ask prayer that the computer would be returned. Okay, so pray for Jean-Marc, Jean computer stolen, looking with the language project, and we had lots of documents on there, so pray for its return. Barb. Okay, so I have a card from Misty, the girl we've been praying for with a hole in the heart, and she's, gave a, well. and she's doing well. So it's a praise too. And she gave a sent a thank you card, saying of all the prayers, the meals feel real cared for by this congregation. Ricky. So pray for Carmen and the wrist, and you have a surgery coming up or not? A second opinion, okay. So I ask for wisdom again on that. And Doug? Okay. Pray for the persecuted church. Okay. Glenn Mork, <clears throat> if you all, some, most of you know, is involved with Hope for Children of Africa. And in that area, Ebola is breaking out. And so, in Uganda, so we're praying for, the, for that situation. Um, he was told that he cannot travel there. So he's holding off to like January, February. So just pray for the people who are there and the families and those orphan children. Okay, let's take these to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do thank you that we do have that privilege of coming to your throne room. We know that we are not worthy of that in our own mind or our own self because of the sinful nature that we have. But because of your work 
of Christ on the cross, we can have that opportunity, that privilege, that joy of running into your throne room with our requests and letting you know what is on our heart and mind. And even though our prayers may sometimes be inadequate, we know that the Holy Spirit is praying within us and for us and that you, Christ, are making intercession for us next to the Father in the most holy and wondrous place. We lift before you Bob and Mary Kay Morris in the recent loss of their son Isaac. The loss of a child is a hard, hard thing and almost unfathomable in some of our minds. But you know what it's like because you lost your son. You, you saw him suffer, you saw him die. But there is a hope and we pray that as believers in the body of Christ we can come alongside and give the comfort that we have received from you to Bob and Mary Kay and that those around them would uh, be ministers of comfort and peace and the joy of heaven. We ask for your help with those people who are still battling and in forest fires and those who have lost homes in those horrific times. We pray for the ones who are actually battling it, giving them the strength and fortitude that only you can give, coming alongside. Also pray for those people who are lacking in food, and you are the one who can sustain and provide. You do it for all of us by giving us our daily bread. Help us and call us into the fold and need of being able to help sustain those people by our means or wherever we've been called to do to fill that lack, that emptiness that needs to be done by hands of your people. We lift up before you unspoken prayers that you know and you are the one who answers in your time, in your way. We ask that you would also have good harvest weather for the fields of bringing in the crop that you have watched over these summer months with the rain, with the heat, with the growing, that it would be a safe time also for those who are gathering it in. We pray for Merle Schmieg in the hospital, ask for doctor's wisdom and guidance, trying to diagnose what the problem is. Uh, you are the great physician, you know, and it's not a mystery to you, but we ask for you to reveal it to those who are working with Merle, that they would be able to come to an, a solid answer, and that you would be with Merle in this time, that you would minister to him, that you would come alongside, that uh, your will, we ask that be done in all these cases, but that your will would be that he would praise or give thanks to you, that he would call upon you, that he would let you know his pain. We also pray for the president of our country in the turmoil that sometimes we sense it's all in. It's not in your hand, not in your mind a turmoil. It's being played out as you know because you're the ultimate one of being sovereign God in control of all things. We ask that you would be in these midterm elections also, your hand of guidance, uh, that we would be always looking toward you when our concerns or our tendency is to put the power into man's hands realizing it isn't it is in your hands and we pray also for the supreme court justice process that again your sovereignty would reign over that giving the peace and comfort to those who are struggling through this but also to give wisdom and guidance and an answer that would be acceptable to people even though some will not accept you but accept the process Ask for a strength for those who are involved in the car accident of David Filer and family, that you would come alongside, be the guide, the comfort, the strength. If it means calling us, call us. We are your people. We are your sheep that are to be coming and be your hands and feet and, and arms here on earth to comfort one another. Pray for Stephen Paulson in the, in the cancer dattling with cancer in hospice, again bringing comfort and your word of encouragement to him that you are the God who is in control. You are the one who loves, who gave his son for him, for all of us, that we may be redeemed, may be saved, may be called to your side in heaven. 
pray for Jean-Marc with his computer being stolen and with all the language projects that, and documents that are on that, we pray for the return, a safe return of that computer, that your word may be and your work may be continued in uh, Africa about that. Pray for uh, Misty. We thank and praise you that she's doing better uh, with her hole in the heart surgery, that uh, we thank you for the thank you that she sent to us, that encourages us as prayer people, as people who come alongside preparing meals, uh, that we show concern for each other as we should as a family. Uh, we give, we listen, we give counsel where we can give counsel, but mainly to sometimes just remain silent and listen to the, the pleas and, and then give them to you firmly that you are the one who can answer. We pray for Carmen and her wrist and the second opinion on a, what would be the next step and that wisdom and guidance would be done there. Also pray for the persecuted church, those who are struggling, those who are being tortured and killed and put into horrible situations just standing up for you where we take it for granted here. We don't even think a second time of just getting up and going to church or to praying, whereas for them it's a life and death decision. But they know that you are the one they are praising. You are the one who guides, you are the one who protects, and you are the one ultimately they are serving and giving the praise to. And we pray for the Ebola outbreak in Uganda and for the hope uh, of Children in Africa mission there with the orphans and that you would protect and that the people who are working with that would have the wisdom and would be able to stop that in your power, your strength. You are the one we give that to as we lift up all these prayers before you in the holy and precious name of Jesus who has saved us from our sins and redeemed us and has given us the truth that we live by today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to call up Craig for the reading of the scripture. If you'd please stand in reverence for the word of God. Good morning. This morning our epistle lesson is from James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Reading in Jesus' name. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. The gospel lesson this morning is taken from Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. Mark chapter 9, 38 through 50. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a, a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward." And if anyone causes one of these little ones who have believed in me to sin, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled 
than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Here ends the reading. Will you re <clears throat> say the Confession of the Apostles' Creed found in the back cover of your red hymnal? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Call upon our ushers to wait and receive our morning offering. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to give back what we have first received from you, and that what you use through this would be multiplied and extended not only within this church, but outside this church in the community and the world, that it would bring people to you, that the knowledge and wisdom and the good news of the gospel would be received and joyfully multiplied within hearts and minds. We ask your blessing on this in Jesus' name. Amen.
message this morning comes from the book of Numbers. Uh, There's two things you should think of when you hear about the book of Numbers. First, you should think about Numbers because there's a couple senses taken in the book of Numbers. That's pretty obvious. But the next thing you should think about is a journey. The, The Israelites are journeying through the wilderness. And it relates to us because we are as well the wilderness of life. And so our uh, setting here to this morning is the Israelites ready to set out once again on on part of their journey. It's about a year after the Exodus. Uh, And I'm not going to read every verse in this chapter because it's quite a long section. That's why we're skipping around a little bit. But the first three verses you see that uh, Israel complains. Uh, And it's just kind of a general complaint probably about their uh, sore back and sore feet and sore muscles, probably a little sleep-deprived and a little irritable after uh, this trip, or after setting out here. And we see, though, elsewhere in Scripture, that complaining becomes kind of a way of life for the Israelites. They complain before this, and they'll complain after this as well. In those first three verses, we see that the Lord gives them a warning. And this warning strikes fear into their hearts. But let's stand and I'll continue uh, in verse 4. And then I'll be skipping around a little bit here. So let me start in verse 4. And yeah, verse 4 to verse 6 to begin. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We we remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now jumping down to verse 10. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth, that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom, as a nurse carries a nursing child? To the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they weep before me and say, Give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once, if I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. Now jumping to verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put his spirit on them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and it is truth. Lord, speak to our hearts and minds. Sanctify us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We see that the Israelites are complaining once again. 
Uh, This time, though, it's not just a general complaint. But this time, it seems that they're they're complaining that there's not enough variety in their diet. Not enough variety. They had been provided for. God had given them manna in the wilderness. It provided in every way for them. But they desired more than God gave them. They desired more. Now this rabble, and I'm not exactly sure what it may say in some other versions, but in my ESV version here, the rabble is likely the group that came out of the exodus with them. Non-Israelites, people that attached themselves to the people of God. Probably Egyptians. And here we have the rabble, this group, provoking Israel to sin. See, they remember that diet that they had back in Egypt, and now they have just manna. And so they're comparing the two, the manna versus their life in Egypt. And this rabble, uh, this group of people, craved the food they had in Egypt strongly. They loved Egypt's food. Notice here how this attitude, this spirit of complaining was contagious for Israel. Notice that. Right? They romanticized the good things that they had in Egypt, making them more than what they were. But in the process, they minimized all the bad things. The fact that they were slaves, they completely forgot about that. In essence, their bellies had become their God. They had sought something else that the Lord had not given them. And in doing so, they reject God's gift. They reject God's gift. They become discontent with what God had provided. That manna, they cry for meat instead. And in being discontent, they are also showing a spirit of unthankfulness. Unthankful for God rescuing them from Egypt. And as the Lord had warned them before, the Lord would warn them again that such an attitude is not good. In essence, the people longed for the life that they had back in Egypt. Their minds were set on earthly things, on the riches in Egypt. But they had forgotten what it was really like, how they had cried out to God to save them. See, it, I think we can learn from this that while God took the people out of Egypt, it's much harder to take Egypt out of the people. Much harder. Now, before we start blaming the, the Israelites, thinking that we're you know, better than them, we must recognize that we too complain. We can be complainers for all the same reasons. There are a variety of reasons that we complain, whether that's our complaints are born out of fear or anxiety, fear of pain, anxiety over the uncertain things in life or some instability that we're dealing with. Our complaints can be born out of selfishness, out of greed. Maybe we feel inconvenienced in some way. Maybe we feel that we deserve more, more riches in this life. Our complaints can be born out of covetousness, greed, lust. Maybe a desire for status, a desire for an easy life. Right? The, world, the world tells you that just follow us and you'll have an easy life, but God never tells us that. In fact, God tells us the exact opposite. See, the old nature, our sinful flesh that we live with is never satisfied. It's never satisfied. See, it's one complaint after another from our old nature. See, our old nature assumes that there is more than what God offers, more than his word, more than his sacraments, more than sacrifice that he gives us. Our old nature is always searching for power, for pleasure, 
for security, for the good old days that we used to enjoy. See, our old nature is always pursuing those things. The ways of the world, the ways of the devil, the ways of our flesh. And for that, God's word tells us that we deserve judgment. That we deserve wrath as children of wrath. We deserve death for our rebellion against God. For setting ourselves up as gods to be served by him. See, that's the wrong attitude that we should have. Notice, though, that Moses complains as well. Do you notice that? As he hears the weeping of the people, constantly weeping at the doors of their tents, not only did it anger the Lord, but it angered Moses himself. The people were acting like entitled, selfish children. You might say annoying little brats. I never called my kids brats. I'm missing one there. Oh, Toby. Toby can be a brat. Toby. But he's only one, so... But notice the difference here between Moses' complaints and Israel's complaints. Notice to whom they complain. Right? The Israelites are complaining to anyone and everyone who will listen. Maybe to just complaining in general, to the air. Which is sinful. It's a sinful way to complain. But look at what Moses does. He complains to God. You know what that's called? It's called prayer. You can complain to God. It's okay. God will handle it. Right? This is using God's name rightly, calling upon him in every need. See, the way the Israelites did it was done in unbelief. But the way Moses complained was done in faith. Now, Moses, maybe his tone was a little bit wrong. Maybe we can say that. It's a little bit... Uh, frustration coming out there. But you know what? God is big enough to take it. God can handle it. Moses asks, why? These people belong to you, God. Why me? I thought you liked me, God. I thought I found favor in your sight. Remember how reluctant Moses was to follow God's will for him? To go to the people of Egypt in the first place? Here, it seems that he's calling into question all that God uh, had, had uh, called him to do. Saying, I knew I wasn't made for this, God. I knew you had the wrong person for the job. He goes as far as saying, God, I didn't give birth to these people. I shouldn't have to carry them along. They belong to you, Lord. These people that are immature, thankless, and unpleasant children. He says, uh, frankly, this is an impossible load to bear, God. And I don't have patience for this people. I'd be better off dead. We see that Moses was okay being honest with God. He laments his vocation as a prophet, as a deliverer of the people, because he had to carry their burdens as their leader. And this burden was too heavy for him. Way too heavy. And so we see a little bit of Moses despairing here. Despairing over this call to serve the people. The frustration and discouragement that he felt because he felt their sin along with his own sin. He felt the wickedness of the people. But he recognized that his only help was the Lord. And so he prayed. He doesn't rebel like Israel does, but he seeks his maker's help. See, Moses is a child of God who has the Spirit of God. And all those who have the Spirit of God find themselves praying as well. Praying that the Lord would help. So when we apply this to ourselves, we can say, if we're complaining to others all the time, that it's just unproductive. It doesn't help anything. 
It's also unkind because that kind of spirit is very contagious. And it angers the Lord. We see that. But if you are complaining to God, keep doing it. Right? That's called prayer. And prayer makes a difference. Prayer makes a difference. God promises that he will hear you and that he will answer you. Whether it's complaints born out of pain or anger or joy. Just be truthful to God. Be honest with him. See, he's the one who will guide you, who, who, who will help you see the error of this world. And he will teach you his ways, his truth, and give you his life. It is only God who can help you with the burdens of this life. As we journey to the promised land as well. Just take a look for a second at God's track record. Right? God knows that we need hope. He knows that we need love. He knows that we need comfort. He knows that we need healing and forgiveness. And he gives it to us. All of it. Through his son, Jesus Christ. Now we're going to jump over to, well, verse 16 and then 24 through 29. We see that the Lord answers these complaints. See, Moses' burden is lightened by God in two different ways. First, he gives him the task of setting up 70 elders, men, gathered around the tent of meeting to be burden bearers. Right? Maybe that's a better title for elders, would be burden bearers. And he gives the Holy Spirit to each of them. And we see that in response, the men prophesy, or we could say preach. Now, we don't know exactly what this looked like, but we do know that it is a temporary ability given by God. Likely for the purpose of not only validating them as elders, but also validating Moses' authority. Well, we find out that there were two elders who were not present for whatever reason, we don't know, Eldad and Medad. And it becomes known to a young man and to Joshua and to Moses. And Joshua takes offense at this. He says, Moses, stop them from doing this. Now, he likely thought that they were challenging Moses' authority. That Moses should stop them because uh, they were in the wrong. But what does Moses do? How does he see this event? Moses isn't worried. He says, no, I don't need to stop them. He recognizes that these two also had been called. Right? They weren't competition in any way. They had been called by God, given his spirit to be servants and leaders to the people, to bear the burden. In fact, Moses goes as far to say that he wished that all people, all God's children, had the spirit given to them. See, what Moses is doing here is recognizing that God is being merciful to him. And he's thankful because there's a relief there now. It's a sign of God's mercy towards him and the people. And so he's thankful for God's intervention in this way. His prayer had been answered to have his burdens lifted. The other way that Moses' burden is lifted is that God is the one who provides the meat. I didn't read this part, but if you, if you go back later and read verses 31 through 35, you'll see that meat was given for these, to these ungrateful people. Meat was given. Quail was brought in on the wind, and not just for a day, or two days, or three days, but for a whole month. Moses mentions about 600,000 soldiers, but there was probably upwards of 2 million people. Can you imagine that many quail for 2 million people for a whole month? Talks about how the quail were stacked high, and just there was no room anymore. And what were the people's response? They hoarded the quail. The least that anyone gathered was six bushels of meat. 
once again, God promised that though this time in giving them meat, it was more of a discipline than it was uh, a gracious thing because they would hate this quail that they were given. It would become loathsome to them. But this was the discipline of the Lord. This is what the people needed at that time. Friends, know that Jesus lifts the burden of ungrateful complainers like us. The Father has been immeasurably kind to us as he provides for us and protects us. Why does he do so? Because he's just simply a good God. When we complain and whine, we find that God is generous. And yet, we still sometimes act in despicable and stingy ways. We don't deserve the things that God gives us. And yet, God is still patient with us. Which is clearly evident by him sending his son Jesus. Psalm 86, verse 15 says, But you, O Lord, are a merciful and gracious... uh, Sorry, But you, O Lord, are a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. See, he's patient with us. He sent his son Jesus to sinners to bear the burden of sin, which, by the way, is an impossible load to bear for us. Remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, how he asked his disciples to come and pray with him to bear that burden that he was feeling? What did the disciples do? They slept. They slept. See, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane was bearing a great burden, but that burden he turned into prayer as he sought his Father, as he sought his will for us. Right? Jesus showed love and compassion. He showed grace and mercy. A good definition of grace is not or getting what we don't deserve. And then mercy is not getting what we do deserve. See, Jesus is gracious and merciful to us. And the whole time as Jesus is being tried and tortured and crucified... There was never one complaint from him. Even though his trouble was way worse than Moses. And God would hear Jesus' prayers. He would hear his prayers from the cross as he prays for our forgiveness. Those prayers were answered. See, Jesus on the cross bore our grief, our burden, He carried our sorrows. And there was probably, in Moses' case anyway, some exaggeration with what he was feeling. But in Jesus' case, there was no exaggeration. He bore the sin of all people for all time. He endured that in his person, in his flesh, for us. We see three days later that Jesus rises again from the dead. And then, 50 days later, at Pentecost, we see that he too supplies the Holy Spirit to believers, to those who are trusting in Jesus. Right? What we see in our text for today is kind of like a little bit of a Pentecost there, as God gives the Holy Spirit to them. If you're a part of the church, you have the Holy Spirit. If you trust in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit given to you. And now you too have a burden to bear. All of us are enabled to, and we should, share the load. Whatever that load may be. Maybe it's the afflictions of somebody in the church. Maybe it's grief that somebody is bearing. Maybe it's just the mission of witnessing to other people. Whatever the load is, it's all of our job. It's not just the pastors or the leaders, but everyone's. 
right? The church is where the spirit is shared and where everyone should benefit. Of course, this is through God's word where he gives his spirit and where he equips us to serve him, to serve others. And as we do, we learn that we can approach the Father just as Jesus did, just as Moses did. We can approach him boldly, coming to his throne, seeking him in his word daily, Because that is where our burdens are lifted by Christ. It is only in him. This is why we come to him. Why he calls us to himself. It is only in him that we will find rest for our souls. And so come to Jesus. Having your burdens lifted at the cross. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to us to bear our burdens, those impossible burden of sin. We pray that, we we praise and thank you that he did what was needed, giving his life as a ransom for many. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We call upon you now in every need for help, for power to witness to those around us, Lord, for everything. We come to you. Continually teach us, Lord, Help us to be grateful. In your name I pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing our closing hymn, number 60 in the red hymnal. pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.